It is a pleasure for me being here and able to share with you the research I had a pleasure to work with my mentor, Ms. Mariona, and her team. The main goal of our project was trying to discover a new exoplanet using the data from TESS and follow-up observations from a telescope in the Canary Islands, Spain. So one of the most intriguing questions in astrophysics or fields is planetary science. How do planets form, evolve, what is its composition? Are we alone? So one of the best approaches to these questions is detecting exoplanets and studying its data. One of the most effective det um, detection techniques is transit photometry. Photometry is the measurement of the brightness um, from a human perception. Then transit photometry tries to detect slight variations in the brightness of a star due to a transit. But what's a transit? So here in this uh, graphic, you can see the y-axis is a stellar flux, so the brightness of a star. And in the, in the x-axis, you can see the time, the orbital phase. The main bumps are the transits, where the slightly ones in between are occultations. So imagine you have a star with a planet orbiting, like in this case. So when the planet is in front of it, it's eclipsing it, causing a transit. When it's behind, it's an occultation. So from transit photometry, we can derive some of the properties and characteristics of a, of a star planetary system. For example, the mass of the star, the radius of the star, the radius of the companion, which will be the radius of the planet, the orbital distance, and the orbital inclination. It is, a, it is essential to understand um, the light curve of transit photometry in order to approach um, these parameters. Here again, you can see in the y-axis the relative brightness and in the x-axis the time in days. So here, for example, this star had um, three transits within a period of seven days. Two of the most important missions in, trans in exoplanet detection are the Kepler mission and TESS mission. The Kepler focused on Earth-like planets and it worked until 2011. However, the stars it studied were fainter. Following this novel mission, we have the TESS missions, with focus on super-Earth-like planets in nearby bright stars. Both missions use um, transit photometry for detection of exoplanets. So, our main goal is selecting a star which has potential transits to whole exoplanets which hasn't been confirmed yet. But how do we do this? So first of all, we use the data from the TED input catalog, which is named TIC. However, from the 2044 stars that the catalog displays, we only want to follow up these ones following specific requirements. For example, with the stellar parameters, um, we, we focus on the brightness of the stars. So in astronomy, we have a inverse uh, scale of brightness uh, from human perception. So the lower the number, the brighter the star. Therefore, we are looking for an interval between nine and 12. All um, the stars above, with magnitude above 12 are too fainter for the ground-based telescope, while all the stars below um, 9 are too bright for the telescope to calibrate and observe. We also want to make sure that the star is in the North Hemisphere, so the ground-based telescope will be able to observe it. And we also need to make sure that it has a planet candidate orbiting, not confirmed yet. And finally, that has period shorter than, than 10 days. From all the stars, only 280 followed these specific requirements. And that was the moment to plot the light curve and choose the most potential ones to be exoplanets. Uh, um, 20 stars uh, had um, transit um, potential to hold exoplanets. However, um, to study transit, we need to make sure that when we observe the transit, it's actually happening in order to know the intensity in exactly every moment. Um, our observation was in the last week of July to have the data from R for RSI. So only nine stars had transit during the last week of July. From the final target stars, um, we chose 2294-00092 because it was um, the most potential um, target star um, with a transit potential to hold an exoplanet. So we plot the Liker for um, this star and in the plot above, we have in the y-axis the flux and the x-axis the time. And it shows all the transits that occurred while Tess was observing the star. In the one below, we have in the y-axis the normalized flux and in the x-axis we have the time, the phase. In this case, we have pulled all the light curves into one based on the first transit and the period, which is the time between one transit and the following one. We also used NASA Exoplanet Archive in order to make sure that our target star had transit occurring during the last week of July. So we also need to make sure of the, the elevation of the star. So this graphic shows in the y-axis the um, 
degrees and the x-axis we have the months. So it shows the elevation of the star over the year. So for an optimal observation, we have to make sure that it's at least 30 degrees of elevation. In this case, by the end of July, we have around 50 degrees, so it's optimal. We also need to make sure that our target star is not very close to a bright source of, of, um, of brightness, because that could disturb the observation of the ground-based telescope. This is the most exciting uh, slide of my, present, of my presentation and the research. So we were really lucky to be able to uh, have Artemis, the ground-based telescope, to observe our target star. So uh, this slide basically what shows is that while uh, the ground-based telescope Artemis was observing the star last week on July, there was an object actually transiting, orbiting around the star and causing this decrease in the brightness. So here in the y-axis, as you can see, is the normalized flux, which is the brightness, the energy flux of the star, and then we have in the x-axis um, the time. So now that we have um, the ground-based data, so that we obtain the stellar flux, its error, and the time, it's, or it's now the moment to determine the planetary parameters. What can we obtain from this candidate exoplanet and prove if it's an exoplanet or not? So we use a model to fit um, the parameters of the light curve that we obtained from the Artemis observation and values that we previously know regarding um, the mass of the star, its peri the period of the transit, the duration. And we also made a light curve here with this model and, and you can see the flux in the y-axis and in the x-axis the time. And here are the values that we obtained for um, from the, from the data and the model. And as you can see, the most important here is the radius of the candidate exoplanet, which is in Jupiter radius and units. So we are confident that our candidate exoplanet has extremely potential to be an exoplanet for several reasons. The first one is because, is because of its stellar planetary system. So its star is of type G. And our, um, the sun, our star is of type G as well. So if the sun has eight planets, why not our target star to have at least one exoplanet? The light curve also shows that the orbit is stable because the succession of transits is uniform. We also are pretty confident that our exoplanet is not a false uh, positive because while we were doing our research the last week of uh, mentorship, we found out this amazing article we published the discovery of seven new exoplanets. And one of these ones is our candidate exoplanet. So this is amazing for two reasons. The first one, because all, all discoveries in astronomy are a big step in science and it's very important. And the second one, because this paper that shows um, the discovery of our candidate exoplanet, which they named HAT P59, proved that we are correct, that our methods were effective and our hypothesis was in the right path. So that was the motivation for us to keep working and researching. So we wanted to compare the values of and the discovery paper of the HAT P59 with the ones that we obtained. And here, as you can see, um, the radius of the planets are pretty similar. So yeah, uh, it was a really motivation for us um, having this, this discovery of, the, of this recent paper. As a conclusion, we like to say that our candidate exoplanet that we choose, which is also known as TOY 1826.01, it's effectively a an exoplanet, not only because it's been, it's been recently improved, but because it has potential light curves and likely planetary parameters that reinforce our hypothesis. So, as a future world, we like to keep modeling the parameters in order to try to discover more features and characteristics of this new exoplanet, which has been confirmed, now we can say exoplanet, and compare these values with the ones of um, HAT P59 and focus with other stellar systems. Finally, I would like to thank all the people that has been helping me in this ongoing process and um, learning process. My mentor, Ms. Marina, who I truly admire. I also, the, my tutor, Dr. Amy Silman, and all the people that have been helping me and giving me advice. And finally, RSI, MIT, CE. Thank you very much for this life changing experience that has let me um, improve not only as a student researcher, but as a human being. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Blanca, for that inc incredible presentation. Um, if judges have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Can you, can you discuss the method that you used to align um, the sort of subsequent passages of the, the planet in front of the star? 
So, do you mean, um, wait, excuse me. Um, do you mean in this case? Yeah, this, this phase folding process, can you, can you discuss that? Yeah, for sure. So, phase fold, um, so this one is in order to study in detail the light curve, um, the, the transit, okay? So, what it means with folded is that what we do is we join all, uh, we fold all the light curves and all the transits, excuse me, into one based on the first transit. So we, um, we place the first transit at, at time 0, 0.0, and then we establish the intervals be, um, between minus 0 0.4 and, and, and plus 0 0.4. So for this, we use the, um, the light curve packet. And this allows us to fold all the light curve into one based on the first transit and the period, which is the time between one transit and the following one. Um, did I respond to you? Yeah, so if you're, Basically, how do you how do you pick the time to subtract if one of the things that you're trying to estimate is the period? Okay, so um, you're asking. Okay, so basically, the period um, like of packets um, downloads all the data from tests. So what we only need, what I only had to do is to first of all, I had to understand the packet. So I need what I need the period is to know like the, succe the succession of transits. So with this like of packets, the only thing I had to do was. Um, adding the, per the, value, the period value, which is already a download from um, the data from TESS. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Thanks for your talk. I had a question on slide 17. You compared your best fit model parameters to uh, the other groups. So I was just wondering if you could compare the differences between your parameters and the other group's parameters to your model uncertainties to give us an idea of, of how close the fit is between the two groups. So in the two groups, you mean um, the, um, the recent discovery on mine? Yes. So like, are the, the numbers on the mass of the star, the period of the star, are they within your error bars? Are they outside your error bars, et cetera? Yeah, um, I didn't add the error bars for the other ones, but they are, so for this, I use a method which I'm not really familiarized because I only had three days to do the code. So I'm trying to um, reply the best I can. Um, the reason why my, I think my um, values are close to the ones is because the errors are really short. Um, and then, yeah, so I use a, a, mod, a, mod, a model and I didn't go really far into it as I would like to have this as a feature work. And the only one I wanted, I wanted really to focus is with the radius of the planet. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna talk about this. So here we had around 1.17 and in the other one. So yeah, basically the error is around like 0 0.017 and 0 0.018. So which I think like their errors are small. So I don't really know how to answer you this question because I don't, I don't really have time to go seek into the other parameters. But based on um, the shorter um, uncertainties on, with the upper and lower, I think the value is very really, really close to the real one. And then comparing to this one, which is 1.12, I think that uh, I could improve this by regarding more data. So um, I use a, a statistics method. So if I get if I get more data, um, more effective data, I will get more closer to it. But not only with the radius of the planet, but also with uh, other parameters. I don't really, I'm not, um, I don't really went into deep with this. So that's the best I can respond. I hope it helped you. Yes, thank you. We have any other questions from the judges? I, I think what you were saying, uh, I had a, a similar question is, um, are you familiar, like, is the main difference between the methodology of that other paper uh, compared to your methodology that they just had more data and more powerful models? Or was there a, like, were you using a different technique that you were sort of testing out as well? Um, thank you very much for your question. So um, regard, regarding um, the methods I've been using, when I, when I got the ground, the ground base, um, the data to do the model, I only had um, three days. So for sure, the, um, the model that they use in the paper, it's more detailed, not only, not, not only because they've been using for this exoplanet, but for the other ones. So yeah, like um, the, as, a goal, as a future goal for this research is now that I know that this is an candidate exoplanet and I have this model and I know how to do it and I just need to improve it, I just, my future will be, will be how to get more effective data in order to get closer to it.
Did I respond to your question? Yeah, I, I mean, are we assuming that their data is better? Then because they have more data behind it and more experience or a better model. So I, I think I think you did answer the question is, is that you you feel that your methods would be improved and you would get similar results to them. But of course in science and measurement, we really don't know what the correct answer is, right? So yeah. um, but we think theirs might be better because they had more data. That makes sense. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you so much, Wonka, for the great presentation.